Good afternoon. I am here to share a story about a bike ride that I took in 2010. And I want to share three specific things with you today. The first is what I learned while I was preparing for the bike trip. Second is what I learned while I was actually on the bike trip. And the third is the rallying cry that I feel made it all possible. And that rallying cry up on the screen here is what has to be true. So a couple things before we get started. Um, we all probably know the gentleman on the left. He is seven-time Tour de France champion, Lance Armstrong, known as one of the generation's best distance cyclists, known as somebody who can overcome any obstacle. The gentleman on the right, we might or may not know, he recently had a uh, survival reality TV show on the Discovery Channel. His name is Bear Grylls. He's got the mud on him here. He is known as somebody who can survive for weeks on end with cactus juice and bug guts. I am neither one of these men, nor have I ever been confused for being one of them. I have, however, done a little bit of uh, distance cycling in my past. What you see here is a trip that my father and I used to take back in 2005, 2006. It was a trip called Tosser, the tour of the Scioto River Valley. And it was a 210 mile ride over two days. And it was just something about that ride that I loved. It was something about the accomplishment of being done and saying, I just went across the state on a weekend. So I loved the mental challenge, the physical challenge of it. But again, this is a different story. And so flash forward to April 2010, and I'm, you know, as all good ideas happen, I am at my best friend Chuck Gehring's house, and we're, uh, you know, enjoying a few adult beverages and some cigars, and we're talking about what do we want to do, what do we want to have our lasting legacy for our 20s to be? And during that great moment of, uh, uh, of friendship and, and a couple of cigars, we found out, you know, this inspiration of riding my bike across the country kind of came to life. And so I left that night and I was extremely excited about it. I was like, yes, this is something I want to do. A day would go by and the idea was still with me. A week would go by, the idea was still with me. Until it started to happen that, you know, I realized this wasn't the first time I had that idea. It wasn't the first time that I had this big, hairy, audacious goal. Jim Collins calls it a BHAG for short. I'd actually had it in 2008, I wanted to do it. And you know, I started planning and I started going after it, but for some reason it just, you know, life got in the way. The big hair audacious goal didn't happen. And so I decided if 2010 was going to be different, if I was actually going to do this ride, I was gonna have to approach things differently. And if I was gonna approach things differently, I needed to think about what I did wrong or what caused me not to get it to go in 2008. So I had this great moment of inspiration, right? Riding my bike across the country. And I dove right in and I said, what are the 20 some odd things I have got to figure out? I gotta figure out where I'm staying each night. I gotta figure out how much money it's gonna cost. What bike am I gonna use? I gotta figure out what the gear I need, how I'm gonna pack the gear, how I'm gonna go. What's my route gonna be? How am I gonna get time off work to do this without getting fired? Which was important. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, ah, gosh, it's a great idea, Andy. It's a great big hair audacious goal, but I made some, I, I went to the right and choose not to do it. You know, I had a lot of really smart reasons why not to do it. But what I realized is that those 20 some odd things were becoming other decisions that I was trying to make. I wasn't deciding whether or not it was right for me, whether I was capable and whether it would fulfill a purpose. I was deciding those two things plus everything else was part of the decision. And so what I realized is that I needed to shift here. I needed to commit. I needed to lock into doing it and put myself in a must win situation. I pulled forward when I made the decision to the beginning, and I pushed down all of those other items. They still needed done. I wasn't gonna ride across the country without a pretty damn good plan. But they stopped being decisions impeding my focus, and they started being what had to be true. So here we are. I've got my inspiration. I'm thinking things through, and again, what I wanna focus on is the process and a different way to think about going after big, hair audacious goals. Whether it's for your church, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for your business or your organization, you first need to ask yourself, are you capable of doing it? Not can you do it right now, but are you capable of doing it? With some training, with some focus, with some planning. And then you've gotta lock in the commitment. You've gotta lock in the decision to do it. And I will tell you that it just being something you wanna do isn't enough. You gotta create a little bit of fear in you. For me, I went back to Chuck. Again, Chuck is now my uh, future best man, and you know, Chuck is actually expecting his first child this week, coincidentally. But good friends of him from college, like myself, we all know Chuck's gonna be a great dad. We've known it forever. Because we know that Chuck kinda has this look when he's upset with you, okay? Chuck has what we call the daddy face. He's not mad, he's just disappointed. 
And so I knew if I went to Chuck and I said, Chuck, I'm going to do this. I am going to ride my bike across the country. I would rather die on the pedals up a mountain or getting eaten by sharks rather than disappoint Chuck. So I had a little bit of the stick and a little bit of the carrot. Both types of motivation were absolutely necessary. The last thing here is, was it going to be fulfilling enough for me? And I think what the important thing here is that I realized it, didn't, it couldn't just be about me. It couldn't just be me riding my bike across the country. I needed to feel a greater type of fulfillment for it. And that's where purpose comes in. When you're going after a BHAG, when you're going after a big, hairy, audacious goal, when you're listening today, and I'm sure everybody's been inspired by something that has been said, whether it made you a little uncomfortable or whether it inspired you, you have to have purpose to it beyond yourself. Now, for me, that's when this bike trip changed into Project Levanter. Now, Levanter is a fancy word. It's a type of wind that carries the main character in the book, The Alchemist, from west to east, which was the same direction I'd be riding. And along the way, the wind carried courage for the, for the main character. And so it feel, felt like a pretty good uh, kind of rallying cry for my ride. The picture up here is of my friend Ashley Thompson. In 2006 or 2007, when she was 25 years old, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer. Now, I think we all know there's no good time to get fibrohistiocytoma, but when you're 26, it sucks. I mean, there's just no way around it. So Project Levanter became a ride uh, to fulfill one of my goals, but it also became a ride to f raise money, not to cure cancer, it wasn't gonna solve her cancer, but it became a ride to raise money to just help her living expenses and her family along the way. Very simple. So again, I had my inspiration, I had my purpose, I knew I was capable, I knew I could do it. But again, I go back to it, I didn't just make a commitment and do nothing. I had to figure out all of these 20 some odd other things, but now I was looking through the lens of what had to be true, because I was forced to do this. I had put myself in a must-win situation. And so an example of the what has to be true thinking goes like this. So I committed to doing the ride sometime in May of 2010, and then I had to figure out, okay, when am I gonna do this ride and keep my job? What had to be true is I had to complete the ride and I had to keep my job. So if I was going to do that, I couldn't go when I wanted to in July. Yeah, I would love to go then, because then I could see the, you know, the, the, it would be great, better weather, the, the trees and the scenery would be all types of good, but I couldn't keep the job then, the business was too busy. So what had to be true for me to complete the ride was that I had to go in December, when there were already corporate holidays. And what had to be true is I had to bank all my vacation days and lean forward and, and sacrifice some of my vacation days from 2011. That's what had to be true. And if I was going to be riding in December when it was really cold, I had to go as far south in the United States as humanly possible so I could not completely freeze on the bike. And so what had to be true then is I knew I had 8.5 hours per day of sunlight if I didn't want to be riding at night. So that meant that I was going to have to average 92 miles a day and on and on. You start to see how the what has to be true thinking goes. Okay? Now, I do all the planning. I'm ready to go. I get out to Ocean Beach in San Diego, California, and I dress up in this completely flattering outfit, <laughs> complete with spandex, um, which is never good. And I dip my tire in the Pacific Ocean, and I'm on my way. And along the way, I start to learn these principles, and I start to realize I have to apply this what has to be true, not just in the planning, but also in the execution of my BHAG. So the first lesson I learned, and this is a very flattering picture of my knees, is that perspiration plus adaptation is always better than just perspiring alone. And what that means is you have to work hard, or you have to work hard, yes, but you also have to work smart. And so somewhere, I promise you, on that left knee, there is a kneecap amongst all of the swelling. Uh, this was about five days into my ride when I was averaging 100 miles a day, and more importantly, I was carrying 50 pounds worth of gear in a trailer behind me. Now, I had packed too much stuff, okay? And it was dragging me down. And more importantly, it was making it so I couldn't walk. And so what had to be true for me to complete this ride, because it was only five days in, was that I had to get my knees healthy. And what had, to be he what had to be true for my knees to get healthy is I had to get rid of the trailer. So if I had to get rid of the trailer, I of course made a very fashion forward decision, and I went to a Dick's Sporting Goods in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and I purchased a fanny bag. And I put on a fanny bag, and I put as much of my gear in there as I could. I put the rest in the back of my jersey, the rest of my handlebars, and that's how I went. It was what had to be true. Next one here is prepare with pressure. This one I wish I did. I didn't really do a great job of it. Up here we've got a, uh, a nice picture of a nail that made very good friends with my back tire, piercing my industrial strength, the gator skin uh, tires through the inner tube that's on the inside and back out the other side. Now for anybody who's done any 
you know, cycling or any type of distance cycling, you've probably replaced a flat before. And I've had as well, but I missed it of that 20 list of things I should have done. I didn't really practice a whole lot. What I did do is I practiced in the comfort of my apartment when, where I had, you know, probably uh, the TV on and it was air conditioned, it was nice, there weren't cars going by at 70 miles an hour. And most cyclists can change a flat tire in about 10 minutes. You take the tube out, you put the tube in, the new tube in, you make sure there's nothing, uh, the holes aren't still there, you go. 10 minutes. This took me 75 minutes. I had gone, this was on the very, very first day. I had ridden 100 miles. I had 1.5 miles left to my hotel for the evening. And it took me, and I had been up since 4 in the morning when I would dip my tire in the ocean. I didn't prepare with pressure. Okay? The next thing here is when you're going after BHAG, there's going to be bumps in the road. We know that. But you have to face these detours. For anybody run a marathon, train for a marathon, anything big in physical activity? Yeah. So you guys know you get a really big hunger when you're training a lot, right? So for me, if you can't read the chart, I'll explain it for you. I was eating a lot of food when I was on this trip because I was riding almost six to 10 hours a day. So I was consuming almost 5,000 calories a day, okay? So eight days into the trip, as I roll into Safford, Arizona, I go, to the, I go across the street from my hotel to an all-you-can-eat rib dinner. And oh man, am I excited. This is gonna be fantastic. And as I sit down, my stomach squarely goes from stable and just turns over. And so I put a 20 on the table, I sprint back across the street to my La Quinta Inn, and I am in the bathroom for the next two and a half hours. And it wasn't pretty. I had, the f I had food poisoning, I had the flu, I don't know what it was, the Ebola virus, and <laughs> it, it was really neat, let me tell you. And so I had to take off the next day, and this was the one spare day I had in my ride. I took it off the next day, and that next day I could only keep down about three pieces of pizza the entire day. So that's about 1,000 calories. Now, we've had a lot of really smart people up here, but I think we can all tell you, I know I can, that math isn't going to work the next day. I didn't have enough fuel. The next day was also a 126-mile ride with the two biggest climbs of the trip to that point in time. So I knew I was going to need a backup plan, so I started scouring the internet, and I found the guy who had done the ride before I had, and who had said that here's the name of somebody who actually lives between Safford, Arizona, and Silver City, New Mexico, because nobody really does. <laughs> and here's his phone number if you need it. Sure enough, I get out the next day, I shocked myself and got through 80 miles before I was completely bonked, spent, and out of energy. I got myself to a service station because this was also the first time my GPS went out. This was the first time my family didn't know where I was. So I had no cell signal. I get to the service station. I call up. I've got a number scrawled on paper. It says Joe Runyon. So I pick up the phone. I call Joe. Thankfully, he picks up. I say, Joe, hey, you don't know me. Uh, my name's Andy. I'm doing this cross-country bike ride, and I need a place to stay tonight. Please, please don't hang up. Dramatic pause. Oh, yeah, hey, Andy, you know, that's fine. Yeah, uh, I'm actually getting ready to head into town. I'll leave the back door open for you. But yeah, you're welcome to stay. You just come down. You got 12 miles to so get to Cliff, Arizona, or Cliff, New Mexico. You'll go over the Cliff River. It's the first, mi first water you've seen about 100 miles. Take the first left over the irrigation ditch, the second left over the cattle guard. Drive back or ride back about a mile. I got the adobe house. I'll see you in a bit. Click. I'm ecstatic. I got a place to stay for the night. I don't know what the hell a cattle guard is, but I got a place to stay for the night. Thankfully, I got there. Uh, the picture at the bottom is the, the feast of, I mean, it could have been anything, but it was really, really good ground beef that he had ready for me, full of uh, antioxidants that I needed, and I was ready to go. It's definitely, and he, had, he was an Iditarod champion, so he actually, you know, had a couple of words of wisdom for me. Next thing is make it fun. When you're doing a BHAG, you've got to find a way to create little games for yourself. You've got to make it fun. I've, t I've talked a little bit about um, my ravenous hunger. This is a receipt from a Waffle House in Florida on Christmas Day. I somehow managed to spend $25 on myself at a Waffle House. <laughs> now, the other thing is if you want to see an interesting slice of society or of life, you go to a Waffle House on Christmas Day. <laughs> anyway, I, I spent, you know, it, but again, it became this game for me. I wanted to see how much I could eat, how much could I devour, because you're never full. When you're riding 100 miles or you're training for a marathon or anything like that, you're never really full. I had a, a ribeye steak, four, pe or four eggs, uh, corn, uh, mashed potatoes, a double cheeseburger, a, it was a uh, Texas toast and ham sandwich, two pieces of chocolate pie, all rinsed down with cherry soda. So, <laughs> made it fun. Uh, last one here is 10 miles at a time. This is a different spin on a very common or a very well-known uh, principle of uh, perfection or, prince or progress over perfection. Now this is a picture looking down. I'm actually riding at this point in time because I was so frustrated of what Texas called roads. 
This was, this is called Chip Seal, for anybody who's from Texas. Now, if you're from Texas, I apologize. This is West Texas, which we all know is a different state than regular Texas. <laughs> and Chip Seal is where they take, you know, some stones or some small boulders and put tar over them. And needless to say, over 13 days of riding, it's very frustrating. So, if I was going to get through Texas, 13 days of Chip Seal, if I was going to get through the entire ride of 2,900 miles, I had to take it 10 minutes at a time, or 10 miles at a time. So I make it to St. Augustine, Florida, December 29, 2010. My fiance is there to, to meet me. It's one of the happiest moments and happiest days of my life, period. We had ridden over 2,900 miles. I had climbed over 85,000 feet of, uh, of altitude. I had devoured 129,000 calories. Lost 10 pounds somehow, I don't know. Most importantly though, the team that was around me and that was there back in Cincinnati for me, we raised $5,000 for Ashley. So a couple closing thoughts. We have had an absolutely phenomenal day today. We've heard about the ping idea in the very beginning. We heard some stuff that probably in the middle made us a little bit uncomfortable because it kind of said, what's wrong with us? Because we have so much here and we aren't doing enough. And that's all good. We're supposed to be moved, both in the positive and the negative. I went through this trip. I conquered this BHAG with one rallying cry, and that was what has to be true. I don't know if it's going to work for everybody. I don't know if it works in every situation. But what I will say is this, and if there's one thing that we've learned today, we in Cincinnati, Ohio, we in the United States of America, we have access to resources like no other generation of man has ever had. And the barriers between where we are and our big here, our audacious goals for our church, our community, our businesses, what have you, those barriers are gone. It now becomes a question to ourselves. And that's uncomfortable, right? Because then it's on us. It's not out there that why we're here and we haven't done our bucket list items or we haven't started the business. It's, it's kind of on us. But at the same time, that very uncomfortable feeling becomes very freeing when you ask yourself what has to be true. Thank you.